This episode is a mission to provide you some insight on leadership and empowering others, how to become more self-aware as a leader, building confidence and gender equality. This week, I'm speaking to Kat Howell, Director at Flow Leadership. Make sure you subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel to catch it all. So tell us about Flow Leadership and what it is. Okay, uh, well that could take a little while. <laughs> Uh, Flow Leadership actually came around from uh, research that I was very passionate about. So I've been working as a leadership development specialist for quite a few years now and working on a whole range of programs from um, leadership development programs to executive coaching and particularly in my work at Melbourne Business School as a feedback specialist using a whole range of different psychometric instruments. and. What I realised was that over and over and over, the same questions were emerging from all of my clients and pretty much everybody wanted to know what is the most effective leadership style and what is the best profile to be most effective as a leader. And the questions came from everybody at every level, whether they were emerging leaders or very established, experienced leaders. They really wanted to know with so many different leadership styles that are out there and so many different ways of approaching leadership and so much to learn, they really wanted to cut through all of the literature on the topic and just get to the essence of which one's most effective, which one do I need to focus on to be most effective, most influential, most successful in my leadership role. So I uh, found people weren't very satisfied with the response that actually none of them and all of them <laughs> can be most effective. So. My belief is what it comes down to is if an individual is able to understand where their strengths lie and what they have to offer and what's required in any situation to read the context and be able to respond appropriately is how you are most effective. So the answer of none of them and all of them is because it is important to be able to adapt to the situation. So to recognise what's required in a situation to understand the needs of those that you're working with and be able to adapt your style to respond to what's required. So often people think, well, hang on, does that mean I have to change myself to be something that I'm not to be most effective? And it's not that at all. It's learning about yourself and knowing where your strengths are, knowing how you can utilise those strengths to be your best self in any situation. So. What got you immersed in, in the world of leadership and I suppose helping others? I started many years ago uh, as, as an undergraduate psychology student. So I studied both psychology and education and I started out teaching psychology and then moved into um, a range of different roles. I was school psychologist at a few different schools and worked in private practice for a number of years. Went back to education as a tertiary lecturer for about six years. I started out lecturing on the normal um, you know, psychology 101 sort of classes, so developmental psychology and counselling skills. And I became more and more drawn to more business oriented subjects. So I lectured in organisational behaviour, particularly interested in conflict management and interpersonal communication was another area that I was lecturing in. And it became really apparent that those core subjects of the conflict, the communication and the organisational behaviour lent themselves really well to the leadership development area. So I started working on leadership development programs. I started actually with Victoria Police about 15 years ago and I was running uh, stress management programs to start with and looking at effective coping strategies for workplace stress, uh, which was, as you can imagine, a big topic with Victoria Police kept me very busy for a couple of years and then I joined Melbourne Business School and worked um, on the leadership development programs which I've been doing for about 12 years now yeah. and became an executive coach and a feedback specialist and a whole range of different psychometric instruments. That's incredible. In terms of, I suppose for lawyers or people within the legal profession, at what point in their career should they start to learn their leadership skills? I would say Ideally, 
it is a topic I'd love to see introduced in secondary schools. I think it's never too early. The core skills of self-awareness and developing confidence in self and feeling empowered are really essential skills that I'd love to see taught right from secondary school level. So um, there's no stage I would say it's too early. And leadership, I believe, it's not a position. It's not an authority or status that you've been handed because of your role. Leadership is an activity that anybody can engage in. So through the way you interact with others, how true you are to yourself and the work that you seek to do well, and your ability to communicate effectively with others, to influence in a positive way, to seek out uh, beneficial changes that you might actually be able to bring about for yourself, for your team, for the organisation. Any person in any position is able to engage in those activities. So leadership begins with the self at, at any level. Do you think, as we often hear, I don't have the skills or that's not my personality to be a leader, do you think it's in, innate in us or do you think leadership skills and characteristics can be learned and developed over time? I'd be out of work if they couldn't be learned. <laughs> so absolutely they can. They absolutely can be learned. There are certain characteristics that will be innate in certain personality types that lend themselves more favourably to leadership styles. So people who have um, often a more extroverted personality type who are able to uh, speak up, speak out, have more presence, command people to listen to their views are seen to be more naturally uh, suited to leadership roles but I've um, spent a lot of time working with people particularly with more introverted personality types to build their confidence in themselves to be heard and to ensure that they are empowered to command the attention of those in the room that people will learn that it is worth giving them the time to listen to what they have to say. More introverted personality types need to process their thoughts, they need to think before they can say. More extroverted personality types, they just start talking and tell you what they're thinking while they're thinking it. So you get a lot more in terms of quantity of a more extroverted person's uh, thought processes. Although if you wait to hear what the more introverted personality type has to say, it's more thought through and you will only get the end result of that thought process, not the whole process along the way. It's difficult sometimes for the more introverted personality types to be able to respond in the moment though because they need that processing time to get the clarity of their thoughts before they can verbalise those thoughts. So if they're able to plan ahead, prepare for any meeting that they're having, anything that they want to ensure that they have the visibility that are going to be heard. If they can get the meeting agenda beforehand, make sure they know what topics are going to be discussed, think through what they might be able to contribute on that topic, ensure that they have the clarity in their mind before they step into the meeting, in the moment they'll be ready to go and they'll be able to be heard and say exactly what they want and that will avoid those walks down the hallway back to your office after the meeting going, oh, that's what I should have said. I wish if only I'd had that moment again. So it's understanding differences and looking at where your strengths lie and how you can absolutely capitalise on those strengths to shine where you have the opportunity or create the opportunity if it doesn't readily present itself but also understanding when your style is not going to be the most effective or it's not going to get you the result that you'd hoped for in the moment and figure out how do I then approach this situation to be as effective as I can be. So if you know that you're a very introverted personality type and you are going into an important meeting where you really need to make an impression, do your homework beforehand, preparation, and you'll be ready in the moment. So, and. It's also important to realise that the more extroverted personality types are sometimes too visible, <laughs> sometimes need to filter and not to express every thought that they have in the moment, sometimes think things through before they speak and ensure that what they say is exactly what they'd like to communicate to their audience. So it's learning about when does your style work for you, 
and when would it be more beneficial to adapt your style? For an introvert, say if they were caught off guard and they, were, they needed to attend a media, meeting without mm -hmm. preparing or planning, what suggestions would you give them to help them get through that meeting so that they're, they're okay during it? Positive self-talk. So <laughs> it's really, really important. The messages that you send yourself are going to prepare you for how you behave and how you respond in any situation. So the meeting might have just been sprung on you and you might have been told, okay, great, so-and-so's here, can you jump in? We'd love to hear your thoughts on such and such. And you might feel like, ah, I don't know, I haven't thought it through, I don't know what to say. As you're walking in, do a little mental checklist. Okay, what do I know about this person? What do I know about the topic? What might they want to hear from me? What can I contribute? If I really don't know what I can contribute, what's a really intelligent question that I can ask to show that I'm thinking about this, I'm interested, this topic is important to me? How can I engage with this person in a meaningful way to have them open up and share information that will be useful for me that I can then respond to? So just mentally prepare yourself as you're literally walking the 10 metres to the meeting room, just in your mind, think about, okay, how can I be most effective in this situation? Now you touched on self-awareness before. How important is self-awareness in leadership and how does someone become more self-aware? It is absolutely essential. It's a foundation of every leadership program that I ever run. To be self-aware, you need to understand the impact that you have on other people around you. People who have very, very strong preferences in personality types or, or characteristics, their traits, are so ingrained that they will behave that way in every single situation regardless of who they're with or how experienced they are. They have such strong preferences that they will always behave that way and they're like, just take me or leave me as I am, this is who I am, this is what you get. That sometimes can work to somebody's disadvantage if they're not aware that their style's not working for the people that they're working with. And if they don't have that awareness, they are not informed and empowered to choose a different approach that might be more effective. So self-awareness comes before any of the leadership skills that you might utilise. So to be self-aware gives you the understanding of how others perceive you, how you impact those that you are interacting with and when it works for you and when it might not work so well. So. To become more self-aware, personal reflection, just to think after a meeting or an interaction, to sit back and think, well, how did that go? Were there any responses that were un unexpected or that I hadn't anticipated? How might I do it differently next time to be more effective? But probably more empowering is to get feedback from others. So whether you use this, hundreds of psychometrics out there, 360s that you can get feedback from others, but even in simple conversation. Have those conversations with people and find out what their perceptions of you are. It's really quite confronting for a lot of my clients when they get a 360 feedback report or some sort of psychometric report. And it's like holding a mirror up to them and saying, okay, this is how people see you. How do you feel about this? And some of the perceived negatives can be really uh, confronting, difficult for people to accept and to take on board. And I always encourage my clients to see the value in all feedback, even if you don't like it, even if you don't agree with it. At least now you are informed, you understand the perceptions that others have about you. So if their perception of you is very different to how you see yourself, or it doesn't sit comfortably with you and you don't like that they see you in this way, spend some time investigating what has led them to form that perception of you. What interactions have you had with this person? What behaviours have they observed either in your inter interaction with them or even your interactions with other people? Their perception is based on whatever they have observed, their experience with you to date. It may not be accurate in your mind, but it is their reality. So whatever they believe to be true is their reality. And for some people, unfortunately, if it's their superior who has a very different perception of their abilities or their leadership capability, 
their reality is what they're going to base all of their decisions on regarding your career, your promotional prospects, the opportunities that are afforded to you. So if you are informed with their perception, you know how they see you, if it doesn't sit comfortably with you, you you're empowered to do something about it then. If it doesn't sit comfortably, think about how you would like them to see you, what do you need to do to address this situation? If you haven't had that feedback, if you haven't gone through the process and had the psychometric or uh, done the 360 or whatever it is that you've done to get that feedback, you're ignorant to how they see and then you don't have the opportunity to do anything about it. So even when it's difficult, it's worth doing. Would you ever suggest once you get that feedback to sitting one-on-one -on -one with that person saying, look, you see me in this way, how do you want to, how, how would you like me to proceed going further, further or change? Would you suggest that? Absolutely. At the end of every leadership program, whether it's a day or a week or however long, we always set about devising some goals that are going to be useful for the program participant to transfer the learnings from the program, post-program into the workplace. So in their everyday work role, how do you take these learnings and continue your leadership development and your growth back when you're doing your real job, the day-to-day -day reality sets in? How do you actually continue that learning? And the first goal is very, very often a post-program discussion, either with your superior, your boss, or a person that you might have had some uh, challenging feedback from. So to have that conversation, you need to be very careful in the way you approach the conversation. So to set it up to be a positive and a learning experience, there's a real risk that feedback givers might feel confronted with the need to defend their ratings or to justify the feedback they've provided and they'll become very defensive and they'll shut down and it'll be very difficult to get anything meaningful from them. So I always recommend to the program participants, please start out by thanking them for the time and the effort that they've taken to provide you with this feedback. Even if you don't like it, it's valuable and it's useful to you. And they've done you a favour by engaging in this process for you. So start by thanking them and show your appreciation for the information. If there's something that you don't understand, rather than asking why, they'll feel like they have to justify, defend themselves, they'll be on the defensive, they'll close down. Open up the conversation and say, look, I had some feedback that was surprising to me or I didn't quite understand. I'd really appreciate if you could help me to understand this further. Can you Think of an example where you might have observed me behaving in this way to help me understand what led to that perception or illustrate it you know, in some way. So you're asking them to help you to understand it further. Most people are very happy to help someone who directly asks them for help. Very, very different approach, very different conversation to somebody who feels that they have to defend their ratings and say, you know, why did you give me a three, <laughs> five on this leadership capability? never turn up with a report and put it in front of them and say, here are my ratings, this is what you gave me. Take your own notes, leave the report in your office, take your own notes and think about how can I open this up into a really positive conversation that is going to strengthen our relationship, strengthen our communication and leave me more informed and able to make the changes I seek to make. So approach it carefully. <laughs> In terms of confidence, mm -hmm. so it's something you're quite also very passionate about in developing mm -hmm. people and their confidence. How does someone build confidence? That is a good question. And I have been focusing very much on running women's leadership programs, particularly in the last few years. So I started a um, women's leadership program when I was working with Leadership Victoria and I've been running them for Victoria Police and other organisations for a number of years now. And confidence is always one of the biggest issues that we have in the women's leadership programs. Day one, we start always with the self-awareness, as I mentioned, that is foundational. But after that, looking at different areas like strength-based leadership, understanding where your strengths are and how you are able to operate at your best. What are the opportunities that you have to shine? and believing in your strengths. So often people are presented with feedback about themselves and they just gloss over all of their strengths and say, oh yeah, they're the things I know how to do, that's fine. But these things, I'm not very good at these, I'm gonna put all of my focus and attention onto their perceived weaknesses. 
and neglect their strengths. But unfortunately, if people do that, they've been quite successful to date doing what they do well and they're operating at this level. If they then suddenly put all of their focus onto their perceived weaknesses and spend all of their time trying to develop their skills, they're suddenly operating down here and neglecting the things that they do well. So never take your strengths for granted. Ensure that you are able to utilise your strengths as often as possible for your ongoing success and to be able to shine. And then look at those opportunities for development so that areas where you wish to improve, you work alongside with bringing them up to that level where you're successful. So getting feedback about where your strengths lie. Often we'll go back if we've done a 360 report, we'll go back and I'll get the participants to highlight all of the different strengths, look for those common themes and summarise those make lists. But we do lots of different uh, activities. All of the programs are very um, engaging with the participants. So it's, it's not sit back and listen and learn. It's very much you are involved in the learning process. And we do a lot of um, different activities that will bring out some sort of learning or insight for the participants. So finding ways to build confidence. For example, the Women's Leadership Program I've been running with um, Victoria Police for the last couple of years. Day one, we do a bit of a brainstorming activity, identifying different areas they can, uh, how shall I put it nicely? <laughs> Uh, organisational culture and, and structure constraints is sometimes an issue um, in large organisations. That identifying opportunities for beneficial change. So trying to get away from a big whinge session about all of the things that they're not happy with or don't like, but framing it in a positive way. Where could you see room for improvement? How could things be done better in your team, in your division department, in your organisation? So it's very, very easy for participants to fill up pages and pages of butcher's paper when they're brainstorming to think of all of the things that they would like to improve in their organisation. And then we turn it back onto participants and say, great, now what can you do about these? And we have a six month program at the moment where the participants almost always on day one say, well, nothing, <laughs> it's how it is. We have to work within the structure. It's a very hierarchical organisation if you are, looking for ways to change things and improve things, we just get told no, and it's not going to happen. So we look at, well, how can they have positive influence? Where do they have scope to make a difference? And what can they do? And it's amazing, by the time we get to the end of the program, each participant does a presentation on their little project, their one beneficial change that they've sought to implement in their organisation. and. The women have been able to achieve some amazing things that they sit at the end of that last session and go, wow, we never thought we'd be able to do all of this. And usually it's just the beginning. They've started on something that is important to them, means something to their work, to their team, and it's just the beginning. They're going to continue with whatever that project was long after the leadership development program. So identifying where you can have some impact and really looking at accepting the things that you can't change. Yeah? There are laws. You don't have any say over what the law is. You just have to work with the, what the law is. What can you change? And identify those opportunities where you can have the impact and put all of your effort and energy into making the changes that you can see that will be beneficial. Because that will also build your confidence. Yeah. Each success. So each time you are able to utilise your skills in a positive way, and getting feedback from others that reinforce that the value of the work that you're doing. So constantly seeking that feedback, but taking it on board. One of the very simple activities we often do is um, receiving positive feedback. So many times women find it's difficult to even just accept a compliment and they'll deflect or they'll you know, um, disagree with it or they'll give you the reasons why that's not true. I say just relax, just smile, say thank you. <laughs> Think about the impact you're having on the person who's given you that compliment if you reject it. How likely are they to give you another compliment? Unlikely. Exactly, so for them to feel comfortable, even if you're not comfortable, just smile, say thank you 
and then they'll feel good about giving you that positive feedback and they're more likely to do it again. So being open to take it on board, accept it even if it doesn't fit comfortably within your perception of self, be open to the feedback of others and take it on board. So strengths-based leadership is really, really important to me. It's something that I'm always teaching the leadership development programs. Identify your strengths, really focus on those, be confident and know what you can do well. Be confident to back yourself in those areas. Why do you think most organisations say at performance review time, they always focus on the weaknesses of individuals as, as opposed to like addressing them and saying, yeah, these are your weaknesses, but you're really great at this and these are your strengths. Why do they take that approach? A couple of reasons. It's easier to focus on the areas for improvement because you're giving them something to do with that. Whereas if you identify a strength, well, that's nice, okay, good, so what do I do with that? So people don't necessarily know what to do with that positive feedback. And in Australia as well, we aren't great at giving positive feedback. We have, you know, the tall poppy syndrome yeah. and unfortunately the Americans are really good at it. <laughs> and a lot of the um, psychometric instruments, the normative data that we use is often um, American as well, which doesn't go well for us. It skews us right down to the left of the scale because we're not so forthcoming with positive feedback for others as well as ourselves. So it's getting more comfortable with giving the positive feedback and getting more comfortable with being open to receiving it as well and just accepting, you know, that's great. I really appreciate that you've recognised I did well in this area and you know thanks for letting me know just take it on board and that will build confidence. Now touching on conversational intelligence, mm -hmm. CIQ I think. Yeah um, that's right. Now you're one of the first coaches that have been accredited in this area. Can you tell us more about it? What is CIQ? What? Conversational intelligence is the brainchild of Judith Glazer, who is a coach um, American. She works out of New York. And it was actually one of my colleagues at Melbourne Business School who gave me her book a few years ago. Knew that I was very interested in the area of um, interpersonal communication. It's an area I used to lecture in and it's very prominent in the leadership programs that I run and knew that conversation was important to me and said, oh, if you haven't read Judith's book, you must read this one. And I read it and I thought, wow, it's so aligned with the work that I already do. So CIQ is very much around how do you use conversation to build relationships with people, to build trust and to be able to influence people effectively. So it's looking at opening up conversations to build those relationships to work more collaboratively with people, to get people on side in partnership with you rather than working against people. So um, often in the workplace, a lot of the conversations are task oriented and they're functional conversations. They're closed down conversation. They're not open for discussion. It's very much, this is what has to be done. So Judith has uh, developed a number of different models as uh, level one, two and three of conversations, but uh, there's a whole lot of strategies and techniques that she teaches. And it's really all focused on how do you use conversation to be more effective. So it works really well with the leadership development because being able to communicate effectively with others is crucial. So. Judith goes a bit further looking at um, the neuroscience behind conversations and recognising that when you engage with somebody in a positive way, you have a physical response with releasing oxytocin into the system, which makes people feel good about the conversation and you're more likely to engage further and to keep that relationship or even just the conversation going. When you feel confronted by somebody or you feel that you have to defend yourself or the conversation is you know, closing in rather than opening up, then you have the opposite effect and you have cortisol, which is the stress hormone 
which of course doesn't make you feel too good and has negative impacts. So it's looking at how do you trigger the oxytocin response rather than the cortisol response through the conversations that you're having. So it's, ex it's really fascinating work and it's so well aligned with the work that I was already doing. It made a lot of sense to incorporate that into the leadership programs that I run and, and sometimes just doing CIQ workshops can be really helpful. What's one, your bit, what's one bit of advice you'd give people to have a more of a, I suppose, we mentality as opposed to I or do this mm -hmm. type of mentality? I often tell my clients to have a shoes off mentality. So you've probably heard the saying that to truly understand another person, you need to walk a mile in their shoes. Yeah. I always tell my clients, well, you can't really walk in somebody else's shoes if you've still got your own on your feet. You have to take your shoes off to be able to step into somebody else's. So when it comes to your mindset, be open to have your mind changed. Don't go into a conversation with somebody just saying that you're listening, but really just waiting for them to stop talking so you can tell them why you're right or tell them your approach or your ideas. Actually park your ideas for the moment. Be open to really listen to what they have to say invite them to contribute their thoughts, their ideas. They might surprise you with something brilliant that's never even occurred to you, which you would miss if you weren't open to really listening to what they have to say. So the shoes off mentality is park your needs, park your ideas, park your need to be right to the side for the moment. Invite the other person to share their thoughts and ideas with you. So shoes off mentality, be prepared to have your mind changed. If somebody comes up with a great idea that's never even occurred to you, say fantastic. I love that idea, let's work on that together, rather than needing to own the decision making or the need to be right. So that shoes off mentality is a, is a, a big one that I encourage people, just be open, be positive, be willing to work collaboratively with others for that mutual beneficial outcome. Touching on gender equality, because mm -hmm. um, this is also an area you're very passionate about. So you've established the programs with Victoria Police mm -hmm. um, aimed at dealing with gender equality. Can you explain those programs in a little bit more detail? Sure, well Victoria Police is just uh, one of the clients that I'm working with but I have been doing quite a bit of work the last couple of years. So probably 2016 there was a VROC report that came out uh, for Victoria Police which had quite an impact. Um, there were some questions about the culture within the organisation, um, some question about the very you know, male dominated culture and um, some bullying practice and, and all of that needed to be addressed. So I actually started with some um, male leadership programs that were really focused on areas such as unconscious bias and how to empower others um, that are working with you. So it was really looked, looking at how do males empower females that they're working with to step up? How do they provide opportunities for them to be able to progress in their careers, to just bounce out the scales a little bit. Uh, Victoria Police, like many, many other organisations, majority of organisations still have predominantly males in the senior ranks and there are very few females when you get up to the senior levels in the organisation. So how do you bring about a bit more equality? How do you promote more women into the more senior roles? Because there are many of them out there that are capable and willing. If you look at the entry levels, they're almost equal. But when you get to the senior levels, the women aren't progressing and it's not through lack of skill, it's not through lack of experience or ability, it's through the uh, organisational practices, the culture that is often presenting as problematic for women to progress in their careers. So how do you address all of that? It's very difficult to make changes to a very um, entrenched culture, but you need to believe it's possible and you need to be willing to actually tackle the issue and looking at unconscious bias is just the beginning, realising that there are biases that impact the way people operate in your organisation is only the first step and there's a lot of research out there that just running unconscious bias workshops is not going to 
be very productive. In fact, it can actually be worse because it makes people aware of it and it's more front of mind and can continue to have quite a negative impact if you don't actually do any training about what to do about it. So we recognise there's some unconscious bias here. How do we counter this? What can we do that's a positive practice? So there's all sorts of different strategies that, that can be implemented to help address uh, the unconscious bias. But of course the first step is recognising that it exists. Because it happens with, I suppose, gender and also cultural diversity, which... Mm. Oh, absolutely. One of the corporate clients I ran a program for last year uh, through their diversity and inclusion area, we were looking at unconscious bias and gender is absolutely only the beginning. So there's race, religion, there's um, absolutely everything that you can think of, sexuality to mental health. There's still such a stigma around mental health issues. People will say they'll take leave for a physical health problem, but very reluctant to take leave for a mental health issue and I've been encouraging people for many many years to take mental health leave days and it's actually um, been incorporated in Victoria Police now you can take leave for your mental health without having to give any reason just say I need a, I need a day off yeah. and you don't have to give any reason or explanation you can have that leave afforded to you within a certain number you can't yeah. can't be doing that every week but it's really important, people need to look after themselves and if they find they're getting overwhelmed or stressed or not able to cope as well as they normally would, look after yourself. Find ways to de-stress, relax before you get to that point where you do burn out. What's one practice, say, law firms or companies can implement to address the unconscious bias? I'd like to bring it back to conversation. I know it's an area I'm really passionate about, but start talking about it make it something that is acceptable and comfortable to discuss. It's not a taboo topic, it's not something that, oh yeah, we think might exist somewhere but we don't really know what to do about it, so we're not really going to do address it or talk about it. Bring it out into the discussion and when people start talking about it, it promotes greater understanding of where the issues actually lie and it also presents more opportunities of ways to address any issues in a constructive and positive manner. So bring it back to the conversation, just start talking about it. Kat, this has been amazing, so thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thanks, guys. And that is all for now. But don't fear, as I'll be back next week speaking to more incredible people within the profession. As always, thank you for watching and thank you for sharing this video with your friends. And remember to subscribe to the Gatehouse Legal Recruitment YouTube channel where you can see more.